Welcome to the Vertical Church Podcast. Now here's Pastor Josh Butcher with today's message. All right, we are on week three of uh, the series, You Asked For It. And if you're, if you're new, if you, uh, if you haven't been tracking with us the last uh, couple weeks, uh, this series came about uh, because back at Easter, uh, we kind of we put a, a question on the back of that blue card that I was just telling you about uh, that basically was like, um, hey, what are you interested in? Uh, what is it that like you're curious about? What questions do you have about um, church, faith, relationship with Jesus? What, what is it that you're curious about? Jesus would do this from time to time. He would just hear his disciples talking, uh, asking questions of each other. Then he would jump in and like, all right, guys, let's talk about that. And so that's what we wanted to do in this series. And here's what, like, let me, let me tell you kind of a funny story. So, um, this isn't, the, the funny part isn't this. Last week, we totally changed plans, and um, uh, we were going to talk about the end times, like, is, are we living in the end times? And uh, instead, we shifted, and we talked about uh, depression, suicide, and mental illness. So uh, if you didn't get a chance, you can check that out. Right now, it's on a, a podcast. This week, we'll have, a, have the video uh, uploaded for that. Um, so that's not the funny story. The funny story is this. Um, before, so... Let me kind of give you the trajectory of where we've been as a church over the last, uh, well, what, three months or something like that. So Easter happened, and then we went into this uh, series that was kind of, we called it an unseries. It was just a, a collection of messages that really didn't have a unifying theme, except that we believe that's what the Lord was speaking in the moment. Um, and then in June, we jumped into a series called Wind and Fire, where we laid out like, okay, here's what... We believe about baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, spiritual gifts. We just kind of unloaded all of that. And before wind and fire, we received no questions on the Holy Spirit, like not a single one. And then after, like we started wind and fire and those couple of Sundays where we encourage people like, what questions do you have? We received all kinds of questions about the Holy Spirit and spiritual gifts. And, and I was like thinking, I was like, Man, that's kind of weird, right? Like, we just talked about that. We, surely we don't need to talk about that now because we just talked about that. And, and it was kind of confusing. And so here's what I want you to know. Uh, number one, I have no intention of preaching to you a retreaded sermon. Uh, something that I've already preached. Like that would be real easy, kind of be like a week off because I wouldn't really have to prepare that much. I just grab something and be like, I preached this in June. They asked the question, so here you go. Here's some more, right? Like I could do that, but I'm not gonna do that. So what I'm preaching today is, is literally brand new and fresh for me, some stuff that I've seen recently about the Holy Spirit that I just wanna share with you. But if you wanna if you want to kind of backtrack and pick up the conversation with that series, Wind and Fire, there's a, a playlist on YouTube under our Vertical Church account called Wind and Fire. It's the whole sermon. Uh, week one, I preached a message called Three Baptisms, where we talk about the difference between salvation and spirit baptism. If you ever kind of questions about that, check that out. Uh, week two and three uh, were, were very similar. The second week was spooky, kooky, and weird, which was all about speaking in tongues. Like, what is it? What is that about? Uh, so we kind of, we unpack that. And uh, week three, my mother-in-law, Kim Alexander, uh, PhD, Dr. Kim Alexander from Regent University, she shared a message called seeing things, uh, hearing things, and speaking things. I may have jumped a couple of those phrases around, uh, but it was on that same line. She even said, I might call it spooky, kooky, and weird part two. I was like, you call it whatever you want. Just bring the, it was awesome. It was great. Uh, and then the, we wrapped it up by talking about spiritual gifts, kind of just laying out the nine manifestational gifts that are listed in the New Testament and just sharing some thoughts on that. And so today, what I want to do is, is approach the question. So we can go, what, what about speaking in tongues? That was a question that was asked a lot. Um, so what I want to do is I want to approach this from the perspective of, it's very personal, why am I so committed to seeing you filled with the Spirit of God? Like, why, why is that important for, for me? Like, what is it about uh, spirit baptism and speaking in tongues that 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 to me is so essential that, 
that it's actually part of our purpose as a church. When, when we unpack that purpose, we say we exist to lead people to pursue the presence of God. When we unpack that, uh, it, it's, it's we exist to lead people to pursue the presence of God. What does that mean? Well, it means that there are lost people who need to be found. There are found people who need to be freed. Because you can be found, but still bound. And so you need to experience freedom. And we believe in the presence of God, there is freedom, right? And so there's that. But then there's also a lot of people who have, who have been found, who have had some victory, some freedom, but they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And part of our purpose of our church is to see that happen. And so I just kind of was asking the Lord, like, all right, like, what is that all about? Why is that so important? And here's what I want to try to do today is um, I, want to, I want to lean a little bit into more of like my own personal teaching uh, gift. Um, I will, uh, I can't hold back the preacher. I don't know what the difference is between teaching and preaching. I just, let me put it this way. I'm going to try to slow down and not yell so much so that you can really grasp what I'm saying, but I can't promise that I won't get loud, okay? So just, uh, that's, what, that's my goal today. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. This is my goal. And so to do that, let's, let's start in a very odd place. Let's start with Jesus's water baptism. Okay, Luke chapter 3, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to Luke chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to have the scriptures on the screen. We already got Luke chapter 3. That's awesome. So what, what water baptism is, is in this case, in this scenario, it's John the Baptist who's baptizing people. Uh, that's how the story goes. John the Baptist shows up on the scene, and he starts calling people to repentance. He starts calling them to repent and turn away from their sins, and he baptizes them in the river. Well, one day, Jesus shows up to be baptized by John. Now, we know that for Jesus, this is not a baptism of repentance because Jesus didn't have to repent. He's the only human being alive who did not have to repent because he was sinless. He didn't have to uh, ask forgiveness because he was sinless. So this baptism, this water baptism, isn't quite about Jesus repenting of sin, but that wasn't all John's baptism was about either. It was also, John was baptizing people as an announcement of the coming, what, what uh, the gospel writers will talk about, the coming kingdom of God, the coming realm of God um, breaking into this, the realm of earth. Uh, if you kind of like let your mind go a little bit sci-fi this morning and imagine if you want to think of it this way, this might be helpful. Think of like dimensions, okay? That's not exactly 100% right, but if you go down that road, you'll be okay. And think of like the veil. Okay, anybody see, I'm totally like off the cuff now. How many of you, let's be honest this morning, how many of you watch Stranger Things? Come on, admit it, Netflix, all right. Binge watch the whole show. I'll, I'm, I'm with you, right? So in that show, they talk about like dimensions and you've got the upside down, right? And it's like, what separates the, the normal world from the upside down? Well, it's like, it's this, we can't really describe it. It's this veil, but there can be holes poked into it, and, and influence can come both ways, right? That's kind of how it is between, like, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the, the, this earth. Like, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God is kind of like a hole for the upside down, for the, the, the Demogorgon, okay, just coming on out, right? Like, okay, just go with that, all right? So John is prophesying in this baptism that um, the, the, uh, the coming kingdom of God is, is on the move, it's coming. And that Jesus, when, when Jesus was revealed, he would both make known and release something into this world that would have a, a, a transformational impact. Let me show you this, this passage where Luke, or Luke talks about John prophesying that. Verse 16 of chapter 3, John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is, who is more powerful than I will come, that's Jesus, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Look what he says. He, Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay? So that's what John says. We don't really have to unpack it. He just says Jesus is going to show up 
And what he does is going to result in you being immersed in the Holy Spirit and fire. So Jesus is baptized in water. John dunks him. And then when that happens, heaven takes notice. All of heaven stops when Jesus is put into the water and comes out. How do you know that? Just a couple lines down, Luke says this, verse 21. He says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, look what happens. Heaven was opened. So whatever that dividing wall between heaven and earth, whatever that separates, whatever line that is, in this moment, it gets peeled. The curtain separating heaven and earth gets pulled back and heaven is open. And look what happens. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. So heaven opens and the Spirit in some kind of physical representation, descends upon Jesus. And then the very next thing is that a voice comes from heaven. You, here's what the voice says. We understand this to be the Father, God the Father. says, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. So here's, here, here's what happens, okay? Let me just recap that. So Jesus goes into the water. He's baptized. When he's baptized, heaven opens. However that works metaphysically, I don't understand all the science behind it or if there is any science behind it, just a mystery. But heaven opens. The Spirit comes from heaven and descends on Jesus in some kind of physical form. Luke describes it as like a dove. And then there is this voice echoing from heaven to earth. And the voice says, you are my son, whom I love, with you I'm well pleased. It's a voice of relationship, you are my son. It's a voice of love, whom I love. It's a voice of approval, in you I am well pleased. It's a voice of identity. You, you are, I am who you say I am. Well, you are the voice from heaven. God the Father says to Jesus, my son. And so that's what happens when Jesus is baptized. Now, let's fast forward, Acts chapter 1. Jesus has gone to the cross, he's come off the cross, he's gone in the tomb, he's come out of the tomb, and now he's hanging out with about 500 people. He's, 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 he's talking, he's teaching, and he tells them, he says, I don't want you to leave Jerusalem until you receive the promise, the gift of the Father. And we understand if you've been tracking through the Gospels that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Exactly what John prophesied, Luke chapter 3, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now Jesus is saying, I'm about to ascend to heaven. I'm about to go back through the hope in heavens and, and you're not going to see me. But don't leave Jerusalem because my Father is sending a gift. I don't want you to miss it. Don't, don't, don't not be at your house when Amazon shows up with your prime package. Somebody will steal it off your front porch. Okay? So he says, don't leave Jerusalem because there's a, there's a promise coming. So what happens is, is those 500 people, they start a prayer meeting. They, they, they gather up in this, what's called an upper room, and they start praying. And after 10 days, only 120 people are left. And then what happens next is, is huge. It's, it, it's, it's so high, it's, it's highly regarded in the church. It happened on the day of Pentecost. And so we call the whole movement that really roots its identity in this story, Pentecostal movement. Uh, but this is when the Holy Spirit is given to the church, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Father's promise, the gift of God. And keep in mind, Jesus says, hey, the Father is the one who only gives good gifts to his kids. And he's the, the gift, man. Like you want the gift, here Here's the gift, and so the gift comes, and this is what happens. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Look at this. Suddenly, a sound, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven. A sound, like a, like, like a blowing of a violent wind, came from from heaven. If something comes from heaven, it would stand to reason then that heaven is opened, right? Something in order for something to come from heaven to earth, heaven has to be open. Now that word blowing is a, is a Greek word that means it means blowing, but it also means um, carrying 
or bringing forth. So the implication is there is this sound that carry something from the realm of heaven into the realm of earth. It, it brings forth something. We're going to find out what it is later, but just right now it's like, okay, heaven is opened. That's what Acts chapter 2, verse 2, heaven is open. It, it fills, this sound fills the whole house where they were sitting. Now look at verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now they see in Acts chapter 2, verse 3, tongues of fire that separates and comes to rest on each of them. So fire descends on the disciples. Heaven opens, fire descends. Verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Let me recap. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Heaven opens. Fire, in the Holy Spirit, in the form, in a, in a physical form that we can best describe as fire, descends and rests on the disciples. When that happens, voices are heard, speaking in a language that no one knows. In fact, what, what, if we really kind of parse this, this, uh, this, this verse down to like it's really like um, it, it's, it's, its core, what we would discover is that word that, that, um, that Luke says as the Spirit enabled them, uh, what, what it's really saying, it's, it's, it's this interesting way of talking about the voice of God because it uses two verbs right up next to each other. So what, what Luke is saying is that the Holy Spirit was giving, declaring. That's like if you really just get right down to it and translate it, it's two verbs back to back with no conjunction. He was giving, declarating. <laughs> if that, like I'm making that word up, totally understand that. That's the best way that I can, <clears throat> best way I can describe that is the Holy Spirit is giving, declaring. To them. This is the way in the Old Testament that um, words were used about prophetic, prophetic words in the Old Testament. When the prophets would speak the voice of God, this is how they would describe it. These declarings. The Holy Spirit gave them declarings. So again, Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, Holy Spirit comes. Uh, heaven opens. The Spirit in the form of tongues of fire, some kind of physical form, descends and rests upon the people, and voices are heard that are like the prophetic speech of God in the Old Testament. Now, what were they saying? I don't know. I wasn't there. Nobody records it. Except Luke does, uh, does point us in verse, in verse 11, he does say this, that people are heard them and, and they heard them, this is all we know, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, in our own languages. So track with me this morning. Doesn't it seem like the way the Holy Spirit is released in Acts chapter 2 looks very similar to the way the Holy Spirit... Heaven opens... The Spirit descends, and a voice is heard that is the voice of God. So Jesus' is baptism, the voice is heard, the voice is identity, relationship, approval. The voice is heard in Acts chapter 2, and it's the wonders of God. Other than the fact that in Luke 3, the Spirit rests upon Jesus, and in Acts 2, the Spirit rests upon God's people, these two seem very, very similar. And so, I don't, I don't know if this is the case. This is me reading it and kind of drawing some conclusions. Is it possible that the wonders of God that were being declared, the voices of God that were being heard, were voices of identity, relationship, love, and approval. Everything else fits. 
Heaven opens, the spirit descends, rests upon people in some kind of physical form, and a voice is heard. I wonder if the voice sounded similar to the voice that spoke over Jesus. You, I wonder if the voice was saying, you are my sons and daughters whom I love, and in you I am well pleased. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at the, let's look at the aftermath of this moment. So what happens uh, in Acts chapter 2, this, this like explosion in the upper room takes place and then thousands of people all over the city begin gathering at the upper room because of the sound that they heard. Now keep in mind, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. People are getting ready for work. Kids are getting ready to go to Jewish school. You know, what What is going to make men and women lay down their tools, lay down the the, the tools of their trade, stop their business dealings? What's going to make kids lay down their toys and and put away their their tablets and, 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 uh, you know, Fortnite games and and just drop them all? What's going to make them at 9 o'clock in the morning stop everything because of a sound? They heard a sound. A sound filled the air that also filled their hearts. And and a sound shifted the entire atmosphere of Jerusalem. Think about this. Only weeks earlier, this was the city that just crucified Jesus. That this was, Jerusalem is supposed to be the city of peace, but they just killed the Prince of Peace. Like this is a jacked up city. And this sound erupts, and the crowd gathers. They didn't have any flyers. They didn't have any posters. No social media events. No influencers uh, tweeting the event to draw attention to it. It was as if God summoned his people to a new mountain. If you remember the story of Moses in Exodus and God calling people to Mount Sinai to give the law that now would be implanted in flesh on their hearts and not on stone tablets, the prophet will say. So people start for the first time, in the, for, the, for, for maybe the first time in centuries, maybe the first time since David was king, the city of Jerusalem starts sensing its identity. And you might be thinking, well, I thought people gathered because they heard people speaking in tongues. Jerusalem is an international city. This is the day of Pentecost. There are people from all over the world, all over the known world are, are running through Jerusalem right now. So hearing somebody talk in a foreign language would be pretty common. People, people gathered to a sound, an unmistakable sound that reached into their hearts because this sound was calling to something deep in the identity of this city that was supposed to be known as the city of his presence. But they had left that calling and identity long ago. David declared in the Old Testament when he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and set up the tabernacle that there would be 24-7 worship taking place in Jerusalem. Jesus is approaching the city before he's crucified and he looks at Jerusalem and he says, if you had only known what would bring you peace, you didn't know. He's weeping at, his, at, at the city of his love. And he says, how I've longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you are not willing. And now, because of this sound that erupts in the upper room, the city is alive with the sound of God. And for the first time, the city is waking up to the call of God on their life. But it doesn't just happen for the city. It also happens on a very personal level. It's not just some big, grand, huge thing. It also happens on an individual level. Uh, There's a guy uh, on this day. His name is Peter. The last time we see Peter in Luke Acts, he's being questioned by a servant girl, and he wilts. He's he's asked questions about the identity of Jesus. Who is this Jesus? And he, he completely collapses under the pressure. 
And now the Spirit has descended and rested upon Peter. And so now he stands up at the end, like from the middle to the end of Acts chapter 2. He stands up and he heroically proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ to the thousands who have gathered. And he's not intimidated by the crowd. And he's not intimidated by their mocking. Because they're asking, aren't these people just drunk with wine? What's going on? Verse 13 of Acts chapter 2. And Peter says, no, they're not drunk. Something has grown a backbone in Peter and now courage arises and he brings forth a perfect message in the moment for people to receive Jesus because cowards are only one touch away from God to becoming courageous preachers. One transforming moment in his presence can completely change your identity. So what is it all about? I grew up Pentecostal. That's what we would call this. Churches that place an emphasis on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We would call them Pentecostal. I grew up that way, and I'm very, very thankful for my heritage, for, for the men and women. Listen, man, there are people who paid a huge price to preach this message. They were kicked out of churches. Their churches were burned. They were, rocks were thrown at them. They paid a huge price, but still... I think sometimes we come at this asking this question, what is it all about? And we come to the wrong conclusion. And this is what the Lord started showing me this week. It's not not just about the tongues. That's that's huge, right? Like, I'm like Paul, man. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, I I wish that all of y'all spoke in tongues. Like, that's me. Like, I wish that gift, I wish that that grace would be laid upon everyone in this room. It's awesome. Don't need to to, uh, uh, downplay that experience at all. It's available to everyone. But this isn't really what it's all about. And it's also not really all about power. Whether you're talking about the power to do miracles or the power to witness or the power to testify, it's not about that. When heaven comes to rest upon a person, when the Holy Spirit fills a person, there's a transformation that takes place in their life. The atmosphere over them, over their family, over their business, and even over their city shifts because heaven has come to rest upon them. Let's go back to Jesus' baptism. Heaven opens, the Spirit descends, God speaks, this is my Son whom I love, in Him I'm well pleased. Is it possible that when the Spirit of God, like in Acts chapter 2, fills a person, heaven rests upon them. Is it possible in that moment, just like Jesus, just like the disciples in Acts chapter 2, when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is it also possible that over your life, heaven opens, the Spirit descends, tongues are experienced which is a voice of God declaring over you, you are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. And I'm pleased with you. Is it possible that what we've missed in the whole thing when we got caught up with this and that and the other, and and have we missed that this is about God declaring the identity of his sons and daughters? Well, that's a stretch, Pastor. I think so too, but but there are other passages of scripture. Look at this real quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. Paul says it this way: He says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, Paul says, by the Holy Spirit, it's, it's the Holy Spirit living in me that, that, that enables me to cry out, not, not God most high, not King of kings and Lord of lords, Paul chooses in this moment to describe what we are are, are able to cry out to God when the Spirit fills our lives. And his word he chose was Abba, Father. A word of relationship. 
a word of identity because if he is my Abba, that means I'm his son. I am who he says I am. He's my dad. And I'm his son or I'm his daughter. Look at this. It's connection. It's intimacy. It's relationship. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. What was the seal? The seal was the promised Holy Spirit, verse 14, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Who receives an inheritance? Kids, children. Paul is saying to the Ephesians, you have an inheritance because you're the sons and daughters of God. The Holy Spirit lives in you and he's sealing your identity as that. Is it, what's it all about? It's about family identity. It's about being part of the family of God. So then what's speaking in tongues all about? And this is where I think, I think we, we try to make it something that it's not or what. I don't, I, in the simplest form, I think speaking in tongues is, is the way sons and daughters talk to their dad. It's a, it's a relational thing. It's a, I've been brought into a new family, so I'm changing the way I talk. This is why Paul says, like, I, I, I wish all of y'all did. Because this is, there, there is an expression of love, affection, intimacy, and identity that can't be experienced outside of this. Does it mean you're not saved if you don't do it? Does it mean that Jesus doesn't love you? Does it mean that you're still not his son or daughter? It's, it's that your language changes because the, the, the kingdom that you're most aware of shifts. And so you talk, start talking like the place you're, you're going to and not the place you're in right now. John will say in 1 John chapter 3, uh, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. What we will be has not yet been made known, but when we see Jesus, we will be like him. So in a very real sense, I'm not who I am going to be. The kingdom is, is, is opening up. Heaven is opening up, and the influence is influencing my life. So I'm becoming like I'm supposed to be. So my words change. The way I talk changes. Language and culture are so intertwined that sociologists say you cannot separate the two. You can't separate a language from the culture. In fact, there's a principle called the linguistic relativity principle. Here's what it says. The way in which we think about the world is directly influenced by the language we use to talk about it. So God wants to change the way you think about the world. So God changes the way you talk about the world. God wants to change the way you think about what's happening in your life. So he starts by changing the way you talk about what's happening in your life. So the assumption is that the baptism in the Holy Spirit is primarily to make us more effective in ministry, to give us power to witness, and that's not the primary thing. That makes us professionals in things of God that were reserved for sons and daughters. We're not supposed to be professional sons and daughters. We're just supposed to be sons and daughters. And our work for God is a byproduct of our love of God. And we can't get so focused on the byproduct that we forget the love relationship. And so tongues and spirit baptism, what's it all about? It's about increasing the intimacy of the connection that I have with my father so that I can hear him declaring over my life, I'm his son, I'm the one he loves. In me, he is well pleased. So now, I, whatever I got to do, whatever I'm called to do, whatever I'm assigned to do by him, I do it because I love him, not because I'm working for him. It's a byproduct of my love. And so the, the spirit baptism, it introduces us to the highest levels of intimacy with God. Let me show you this uh, scripture, and then I got one more thing, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Ezekiel 39, verse 29. This, this prophetic word comes from Ezekiel, and he says this. He says, I will no longer hide my face... From them, for I will pour out my spirit on the people of Israel, declares the sovereign Lord. So the outpouring of the spirit is the fulfillment of the quest for God's face. 
And whatever I do for him and whatever I ask from him, I can never go past his face. Because the fulfillment of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that I get to see God face to face. I get to, I get to be pulled into an even more intimate relationship with him where we talk to one another as a father and a son talk. And when we talk to one another as a dad talks to his daughter. Let me show you one more thing in, in Acts. So what happens is some time passes. Um, we don't know exactly how much time, weeks, months, years, maybe down the road, um, since that great outpouring of Acts chapter 2. Um, the numbers of the church have increased. 3,000 got saved on that day, and, and Luke says, man, it just God kept adding to their number every day, people just being saved. Miracles are happening. People are being, people are being delivered, set free. It's just this incredible thing. Peter and John, perform. they, they see the, a miracle happen on the way to the temple one morning and, uh, or one day, and, uh, and because of it, they get arrested. They get arrested, they get questioned, they get persecuted, actually, they get whipped, and then they get released. And when they get released, they head off to another prayer meeting. Another prayer meeting. And then this happens. Look, look at this, Acts chapter 4, verse 29 through 31. Now, this is, this is their prayer. So Peter and John are showing up from, from prison. We just got beaten with like whips and, and, and flogged. And, and now we show up to this prayer meeting, and here's our prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats and get them. No. Just consider their threats, God, and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your servant Jesus. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And spoke the word of God boldly. So the spirit of God falls again, and they're filled again. Now, Acts chapter 2, the disciples are filled, right? Heaven opens, spirit descends, voice is heard. It's awesome. Acts chapter 4, they're filled again. Why? Why would they need to be filled again if they were already filled? Because if you do this thing right, you got to get filled often. Now, that's not to say there are multiple spirit baptisms. There's one spirit baptism, but I am to live my life in such a way that I give away all that I've received while my capacity for him increases. And when we live full of the, full of the Holy Spirit, we live in the overflow of heaven so that only more of him will satisfy my soul. So for those of us in the room that might say like, I think I might need to be refilled. Listen, that's not a bad thing. That's not something gone wrong necessarily because continual dependence on more of God is a good thing. And then that's when it hit me. This is when it hit me. That's why there were so many questions about the Holy Spirit after the Wind and Fire series. It dawned on me. It's not a bad thing. It's not, it didn't have anything to do with really like what was said in the series. Preaching about him brought about a hunger for him. Because when you experience the Holy Spirit, the natural response is I want more of that. And so the Lord just showed me. He said, he said when you preached about me, you increase the people's hunger for me, and so they want more of me. Son, that's a really good thing. And so here's the only way I know how to wrap this thing up. It's do you, or do you find yourself in a place where you need more, where you want more? Have you, do, do you find yourself in a position where only more of him will satisfy because, because your, your, your capacity has been increased. And now, what once was full, do you know how you measure fullness? Like I grew up in a church that measured being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, they called it the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's fine. If that's your theology, that's cool. You measure full by being full. How is something full? 
Well, when you put more in it, it overflows. Then it's full. Are you full is a question of asking, are you overflowing? Are you so full that it just overflows out of your life? And so I wrestled with the Lord. I said, I don't know how to end this thing. And he just said, ask the people if they want more. And so that's what I want to do. Everybody stand on your feet this morning. Every Sunday, we like to wrap up our service with a time of prayer. And so if you're here today and you need a touch from God, if you need God to to, to do a miracle in your life, if you need God to do a healing in your body or a relationship is broken or or you need wisdom or or something from God to just just give you direction, then here in just a second, I want to invite you to, to come up here and we're going to pray with you. And we're going to believe God and we're going to join faith together. And if you need to borrow some of ours, you can, we'll we'll loan it to you, okay? And we're just going to pray that God would move in your life or your situation. The band's going to just go into this song and they're going to sing and and we're going to worship and we're going to wrap up that way. But but if you, if you need prayer, then, then I want you to also come. But if your prayer is that I want more, I need more. It's not a bad thing to need more. It's a sign that your hunger has been increased and your capacity has been expanded. So now you're able to receive more and you're asking God to give you more. If that's you, I want you to come up here because I believe God is going to fill you to overflowing. And then when your capacity increases, he'll do it again. And then he'll do it again. And then he'll do it again. And you just live in the overflow of his love, of that relationship. God wants you to see him face to face. And maybe this morning, he just wants to say a word over your life. You are his son. You are his daughter. He loves you. I could say so much more about that, but when this is spoken over Jesus' life, Jesus hadn't done a single miracle. Jesus hadn't taught a single sermon. Jesus hadn't encouraged a person in the story. He shows up loved. He shows up approved. I want you to understand that. This isn't based on your performance or based on how good you can work for him. This is based on the truth that you're a son or daughter. That's who you are. Because that's who he says you are. And he loves you. And he's well pleased with you. And he wants to fill you with even greater measure today. I'm going to pray. When I say amen, whatever you need today in prayer, you go ahead and make your way up. The band's going to lead us in this song. God, we thank you today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We always appreciate hearing how God is moving in your life. We all have a story to tell, and we'd love to hear yours. Please visit verticalchurch.tv and click on the little pencil icon called Amen Corner to tell us your story. Also, if you'd like to support the ministry of Vertical Church financially, you can do so by clicking the giving link at verticalchurch.tv. Thank you again for taking the time to join us as we point those far from God to life in Jesus.